Good morning. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Matt Albins. I'm the acting director of ICE. Um, just to give you a little introduction as to what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, first off, as, as you guys are, are very well aware, um, there's a lot of media attention based on the fact that you're here proves that with regard to what we do. Um, and a lot of the information that's out there is not quite accurate. Some of it is, is, is misleading or, or um, painted or painted in a certain light. Um, so the first thing we want to do here, and the first reason why we're having these things, is we've got 20,000 incredibly dedicated American patriots that work for this agency. They're going out there under the most incredibly complex circumstances um, with scrutiny that no other federal law enforcement agency and, frankly, no other government agency operates under. Um, and I think they deserve um, their leadership and their agency to set the record straight with regard to not only what we do, but how we do it and why we do it. So that's what a lot of this is, is to try to dispel some of the misinformation that's out there with regard to um, our operations and, and some of the shameful, hurtful rhetoric that is used uh, against the, the men and women of this agency. Um, we've also talked a lot about transparency lately. We have, as you, many of you have taken advantage of, uh, we have opened up our detention facilities, we've opened up Dilly, our family residential center with regard to allowing as much more cameras and, and media coverage of these places than we ever have in the past. And that's a good thing. It's all about being transparent. There's, we are proud of what we do. We have nothing to hide. Um, we're proud of what we do, how we do it. And this is part of that and trying to give you guys the opportunity to ask some questions that some things maybe not get covered in one or two sound bites, which um, unfortunately sometimes all well, the news cycle can, can accommodate. So um, I'm here to give you a couple of high line points of things that I want to discuss, um, things that are ongoing that I think you should be uh, aware of and then we'll open up for, uh, for questions on those topics or others. Um, hopefully this is um, you know, something we'll continue to do on a routine basis. I'm willing to do so. If, if everybody finds it useful, I'll continue to do so. Um, I think it's important, especially um, with all the attention that immigration gets, that so much of our other mission, which is incredibly varied and diverse, um, gets lost in, in, in the shuffle. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to try to at least give a better, broader picture with regard to what this agency does. Um, to help this country to protect national security and public safety every single day. Um, so after I've done the questions, after I do the Q&A, there may be some questions you guys are asking for in-depth information or things that probably not something we can get into in real depth right now. Um, I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards. We'll have some of the leaders from the various programs and components that are here as well that might be able to give you a little bit more context um, than I can in a, in a, in a short briefing. Um, but we're happy to have discussions and obviously if there's follow-up, you have our public affairs contact numbers. We're more than willing to uh, provide you any follow-up that may be required as a result of this. Um, the first thing I want to highlight, um, and we've done obviously from as a department level, we rolled out our, our uh, anti-human trafficking campaign last week. Um, this is Human Trafficking Victim Awareness Month. And I wanted to talk about what HSI is doing in that space. Um, again, this is one of the incredibly important missions that we have here within ICE. Um, it's one that, that doesn't probably get as much attention as it deserves just because of so many other things that are going on. Um, but it's incredibly important, the work that is being done uh, by Homeland Security Investigations to combat this human trafficking scourge is, is unbelievable. So we have a two-prong approach when we've worked these cases. Our first is obviously to try to identify and dismantle these criminal gangs that are involved in human trafficking and smuggling. Um, obviously, labor trafficking is part of that as well. To give you an idea of context, last year HSI initiated 1,024 cases, uh, made almost 2,200 criminal arrests, over 1,100 indictments, 691 criminal convictions, and probably the, to me and I think probably to the people that are actually working these cases, the most important stat, 428 victims rescued or assisted um, as a result of these investigations. When we talk about this, I think sometimes people just say human trafficking and, and it rolls off the shoulder as to what this really means. We're talking about children and, and, and women that are being sexually exploited. And when we say rescuing, this may be real live time people being ex sexually exploited and abused and, and violated in the most obscene ways possible that our agents are able to go in there, rescue these victims, um, and prosecute these dangerous organizations that are involved in this, this heinous crime. Um, those numbers I gave you with regard to cases initiated, that was a 21% increase. So think about what, we're what we did last year in, the, in this human trafficking space. 
considering all the things we had going on, on the, at the border and the crisis that we were dealing with, we still had a 21% increase over FY19 in human trafficking cases. We had a 38% increase in arrests. And as I mentioned the victims, that's a 39% increase in victims assisted and rescued. Um, that's the second prong of our approach in the human uh, trafficking arena is a victim-centered approach. We've made significant investments into our victim assistance program so that one, not only can we prosecute these cases and have the, these, these victims available to serve as witnesses, but even more importantly, to get them the services that they need and that they're entitled to, to help them get back on their feet and help them recover from um, the terrific crimes that they have, uh, horrific crimes that they've suffered. Um, so we now have 30 victim special assistance specialists, one in every special agent in charge office, so those are our HSI field offices, our SAC offices. Um, We've hired forensic interviewers to assist. Obviously, we don't want to re-victimize in the course of doing these investigations. We certainly, the last thing we want to do is re-victimize these victims. So we have specially trained, highly dedicated forensic interviewers that know, and many of these came from us from state and local jurisdictions where they did these cases on a daily basis, know how to properly interview these, these victims in a way that doesn't um, re-victimize them or create further stress or, or pain but yet enables us to get the information so that we can do these prosecutions so there aren't further victimizations by these organizations. Um, to give you an idea of context, we provide assistance to 2,600 victims, over 2,600 victims last year and conducted almost 1,200 interviews, both domestically and internationally. Um, what we're doing this year going forward as we move forward with the DHS strategy as well as um, ICE's own initiative um, is really increasing our outreach. So we have a program called the Stra Strategic Trafficking Outreach Program, STOP. Uh, what we are doing in that arena is targeting those industries where individuals who work in them may encounter, may be more likely to encounter human trafficking victims than perhaps other industries. So for example, you're talking about hospitality. You know, hotels are obviously frequently used um, by these criminal organizations to facilitate their crimes. Medical professionals. Right? A lot of these individuals end up being beaten or abused and end up having interaction in emergency rooms and, and the like, which where we can get this information and try to get them re to recognize um, the signs that somebody might be trafficked. And obviously the transportation industry, we've worked with the airlines for quite a long time, but even truck stops and places like that um, where these individuals may be taken across the country and, and being you know, re-victimized over and over again in different cities. Um, to give you context of that, we last year HSI, and a lot of this is done overseas. So working with our field offices overseas, our attaches, which we have more than 70 attache offices overseas, um, HSI conducted 22 human trafficking uh, events at international law enforcement academies and trained individuals, law enforcement officers, and other professionals within other countries and from 73 different countries. Um, so we're not only attacking it domestically, uh, we are internationally as well. And the last thing I'll mention on this topic and happy to answer questions, obviously, as we go along, um, at what we've seen at the Super Bowl. And obviously, that's on front and center of everybody's mind right now with, with the game coming up next weekend. Um, we continue to deploy assets to Super Bowls. Uh, we've done this for, for years. Uh, we know that large-scale events such as these are ripe for human traffickers to exploit. Um, over the past two years between Atlanta and, and St. Paul, we made more than 160 arrests of human traffickers or human trafficking arrests at the last two Super Bowls. Um, and we rescued over two dozen victims um, during those. So we will be out in full force um, doing what we do on the human trafficking side. Obviously, we'll still be there doing what we do with regard to intellectual property rights and, and the important role that that plays. Um, but that's what we're doing on the human trafficking side. So um, another thing I want to highlight, which um, we've talked about or I've talked about in the, in the publicly and in front of Congress as well, is Operation Noble Guardian. So what Noble Guardian is, is what we've seen as a result of, if you recall, last summer, we TDY'd 400 or so special agents and intel analysts down to the border to deal um, with the crisis that was going on, especially when it came to the humanitarian aspects of family fraud and what we learned, and we, which we knew was happening, but we didn't realize the scope of it until we, we were down there, boots on the ground, was the amount of, of children that were being recycled and utilized for the sole purpose of allowing an unrelated adult to pose as a family unit and come into the country um, knowing that they were going to be released because we couldn't detain them for long enough to get them through the immigration process under the Flores decision. So we have identified multiple criminal organizations that are involved in just this type of, of crime. Um, 
We have hundreds of active invest. We have dozens of active investigations. We've made over 404 arrests, immigration arrests for individuals involved in this child recycling. And I'm not talking about the individuals presenting themselves at the border. I'm talking about people here in the interior of the United States that are involved in these in these uh, operations. We've got six criminal arrests thus far um, for these child sm smuggling rings. Um, again, this is one of the issues that we've talked about multiple times, and you've heard everybody within DHS talk about for years, is the loophole created by the Flores Settlement Agreement that Congress has failed to address has established this environment which allows these crimes to occur. Um, we're even seeing it where it's not even necessarily a child being recycled, but it's a parent bringing that child here to the country just so that they could be released. And then three months later, once they've gotten released, they're sending the kid back home. So they're subjecting this child to the trauma that occurs as a result of that dangerous journey where we know a large percentage of, of, of children um, are being sexually and or physically abused on the, in the process. They're doing it just because they know they can get released. Um, again, we could stop this tomorrow, we close those loopholes, allow us to detain these families for a short period of time as they go through the immigration process, um, and we would cut this out. But right now, Congress has failed to act again um, with regard to closing those loopholes with regard on, on the Florida Settlement Agreement or ability to detain these families. And as a result, we are almost encouraging people to either rent a child or bring their own child and have them suffer the trauma of that journey, when in reality, they're not actually gonna stay here. So when you hear about you know, that's one of the th things you talk about separating families. These families are self-separating. They're bringing the child for the sole purpose of being able to be released. And frankly, when it comes down to it, that's what it's about. It's about the release. Um, these people want to get to this country and get released because they know the chances of them being apprehended. Most of them aren't going to show up for their hearings. Uh, most of them aren't, aren't valid asylum claimants under the laws of this country. And they know that the chances of getting arrested at the end of that process are small, and it's a risk that they're willing to take. If we shut those avenues down and stop releasing, as we've seen what we've done recently with some of the things at the border with MPP and ACA and the IFR, where we've been able to stop those releases from occurring here in the United States, we've seen the numbers drop drastically. Why? Because they're not getting released into this country, and that's what they're looking for. Um, Noble Guardian was also worked in conjunction with the family fraud surge, which we talked about. Um, to give context on that, we identified over 702 fraudulent families almost 1,500 fraudulent documents and claims, almost 1,100 prosecutions. Um, and we've seen the numbers actually drop as we've gone through. Um, you know, I mentioned all the various programs that we're utilizing, and I'm sure there'll be questions on those. Um, but I, I, I don't think you can discount um, the, turn, the deterrent effect of what we've done at the border to reducing the flow. When these criminal organizations can no longer create these fake family units and bring, have them come present themselves or come across the border illegally and be released, um, that kills their market. They don't have these individuals um, to utilize. When they can't rent children because what we're doing with Noble Garden or what we're doing with DNA testing, verifying identities when there's questions, um, you know, that slows down the traffic. And I'll highlight one case for you um, which shows the ruthlessness of some of these people. Uh, we had a case uh, down in, the, in the RGV few months back where a woman presented herself or was arrested, I can't remember which, uh, with a two-month-old. The officers and the agents that were investigating that case, something wasn't right. They went and put them in for DNA testing and they did three or four tests and the DNA test for the child kept coming back inclu inconclusive. In fact, kept coming back with two different strains of DNA, which isn't humanly possible. You know what it was doing? The mother was spitting into the child's mouth put her DNA into that child so they could be released as a family unit. So that's what's going on down at the border. That's the humanitarian crisis we're talking about and that we're trying to deal with. So luckily she's in jail, the child was rescued, um, but that shows the heartlessness of some of these individuals and what they're willing to do to come to this country illegally. There's been a little news lately, too, with regard to uh, sanctuary cities and subpoenas. You might have heard a little bit about that. Um, what we've done with the subpoenas is, is at this point, we're, we're relegated to utilizing tools that we haven't used before because we haven't had to. Um, you know, it used to be not that long ago, we would get cooperation from every law enforcement, just about every single law enforcement agency in this country. 
um, not only with regard to honoring our detainers, but letting us into the jail so that we can interview people and make determinations with regard to the people that they've arrested for a criminal violation, and we can make a determination whether or not that individual is here lawfully, and if they are, are they subject to removal, and if they're here illegally, um, what charges we would lodge against them. Um, and of course, obviously, if they honor the detainer, they turn them over to us in the safe confines of that jail, prevent that person from being released to the street where they could commit more crimes, which we've seen time and time again, tragically. Um, or at the very least, you know, give us notification, let us know that this person is going to be released. But they won't even do that. They won't even pick up the phone. Um, they won't send us an email and say, hey, this guy is going to bond be bonding out in a couple hours. If you want him, come get him. Um, most jurisdictions in the country still work with us, but there are those, especially very prominent large ones, where there's large numbers of criminal aliens, um, don't cooperate with us. And it's a huge public safety risk. Um, we've seen the tragic results that just happened last week, last week in, in New York, um, where a 92-year-old woman was killed as a result of um, New York failing to honor a detainer or give us a call, let us know this guy is being released. Um, so what we're doing is utilizing these subpoenas to try to get information. If we can't get into the jails, if they won't cooperate with us, the very least we need is some information that we could utilize to conduct an investigation to go try to find this person. Um, but there, a lot of places aren't even giving us the information. They won't give us the residence, they won't give us phone numbers or the individual phone the individual had when he was arrested, um, they won't tell us where he works, they won't give us what type of car he drives, all this other th these sorts of things that are essential to conducting an investigation and for us to find these individuals. And our goal is to find them before they commit further crimes, right? We're actually able to prevent crimes if we can get these people off the street. Um, to give you an idea of context, and, and there's a lot of, around, uh, well, these are you know, minor criminals, small time, first time offenders. We arrested about 123,000 criminal aliens and those charged with, criminal, uh, with crimes last year. That accounted for about half a million criminal charges. That's an average of four charges per individual. So these are not low level offenders, first time offenders. These are individuals who are in and out of the criminal justice system. Just look at New York. We lodged 7,500 detainers last year. That accounted for over 20,000 different convictions and crimes. You wanna talk about fighting crime and, and, and keeping your, your streets safe? How much time could NYPD have dedicated to doing other functions instead of continually arresting people that are here illegally, have no lawful right to be here and are committing further crimes? Uh, we could actually take those people off the street. We've seen recidivism rates in some places as high as 50%. Those are preventable crimes. ICE can actually help these communities. Most, you ask, ask most law enforcement professionals, especially police departments, they'll tell you they cannot commit cr prevent crime. They're responding to crimes most of the time. We can actually prevent further crime because we know these individuals, when released, often go back out and commit further crimes. We can stop that. So going back to the subpoenas, we're expecting that these, these jurisdictions, we've done uh, Denver and New York, we expect them to comply. If they don't comply, we'll be working with DOJ. Um, to go and, and go to district court and get an order to force them to um, comply with the requirements. It's under the law, 8 CFR 287.4 little d, look it up. They're required to share that information with us. Um, so we, we're not doing this as a threat, we're doing this as a last resort to try to get the information so that we can do our job and to keep our streets safe. Um, to try to give you an idea, just real quick on, on the types of individuals that we've been lodging detainers against, especially in these two jurisdictions, are the ones we serve subpoena, subpoenas on. Um, we actually have Riaz Khan, um, the individual who's now sitting in jail after stabbing his dad with a broken coffee mug in the chest that wasn't enough for New York to turn him over to us on the detainer. Um, we filed information on that case, obviously. Um, we have a 26-year-old citizen of El Salvador who was arrested in September for assault, wanted in El Salvador for homicide. We lodged a detainer. He was released from custody in December. We never got a call. He wasn't turned over to us. Now he's at loose. We have a 38-year-old Mexican citizen um, was arrested by NYPD in January for attempted rape, unlawful imprisonment, and attempted assault. His criminal record included arrests for DWI and criminal mischief. Additionally, he'd been caught five times trying to come to this country illegally. Again, we lodged a detainer. We, didn't get, we received no cooperation. 38, another 38 year old citizen from Mexico, arrested by NYPD in October. We lodged a detainer after his arrest for drugs. It wasn't honored. In 2012, this individual spent 60 months in federal prison for importing meth. So these are the kind of people that get back out on the street as a result of, of jurisdictions not cooperating with us. A couple of the cases in Denver, um, individuals arrested for sexual assault 
eight other convictions, including drugs, DWI, and illegal reentry. Vehicular homicide, he'd been arrested a week, less than a week before for DWI, and they didn't honor the detainer. Three other DWI convictions, convicted for battery with a deadly weapon and theft, and been removed from the country several times. Last one was a man who was arrested for child abuse, assault, and strangulation assault. He too was released from Denver County Jail after ICE detainer had been lodged. He had three previous convictions for DUI and had been deported five times. So this is the people that we're trying to get cooperation from. It shouldn't be controversial. It shouldn't be difficult for ICE to get cooperation from other law enforcement agencies to get these bad guys off the street. And what I think you saw in New York when you heard the cops up there on the, on the dais and, and, and in the media afterwards, they're willing to help with us. They want to help with us. It's either their leadership or their political, uh, politically appointed people um, in their jurisdictions which are preventing them from doing so. It's good policing. It's common sense police work. It's common sense for public safety to get criminals off the streets. Um, you know, we don't do politics. Um, there's not one person in this agency, including myself, that needs a single vote that needs a single dollar from a donor or a single endorsement from any special interest group to do our job. We do our jobs because we're sworn federal law enforcement officers and that's what we do. Um, so we have no ulterior motive other than doing our jobs, keeping the communities that we swore to protect safe. So I'll leave it at that and uh, open up to other questions as you may have. So thank you. Yes, ma'am, right in the front. Thanks so much for doing that. Um, earlier today, the State Department issued new rules on birth tourism. This is something that ICE HSI has been involved with in the past. So are you coordinating with State Department and are you providing any additional information or guidance to offices around the world and or airlines? Yeah, so certainly this, again, this is a DOS regulation with regard to the requirements. They control the visa issuance process and what's required. I can tell you is, we are working cases. There was a, we actually had the first federal prosecution um, for a, a birth tourism case last year, back in the fall, in Orange County, California, where the individual was involved in this charging individual um, pregnant uh, Chinese nationals up to fifty thousand dollars to come here as birth tourists, so they could give birth here in the country. Um, we seized uh, I think close to a million dollars worth of assets from this individual. They were sentenced to prison uh, for the visa fraud that they were involved in. So we will certainly continue to vigor vigorously. Um, prosecute and investigate those cases that fall underneath our purview. Hi, Maria. Um, that uh, investigation started under the Obama administration, right? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it did. I, I don't have the complete okay. details, but I can tell you this. You know, the investigations that we conduct now are the same ones that we conducted under the Obama administration, under the Bush administration. I was hired under the Clinton administration. The, the laws generally haven't changed with what we do. We enforce the law equitably, fairly, professionally, regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of hold, who holds the, the, the legislative branches in this country. And, and just a quick question about the birth tourism issue. Can you put that into context for us? Uh, how big of a problem is that? This is becoming a, a policy that's going to affect consular offices all over the world. Um, you know, what, what, what do you think they should ask women who are trying to come to this country? Again, Department of State handles the, the visa issuance process. They do the consular interviews overseas. I'm not in a position to sit here and tell DOS how they should do the work. Well, certainly, if we have information on groups or, or, or intel with regard to people that might be coming and trying to exploit um, those regulations, um, we certainly share that information and work closely. So if you want like an in-depth dive, we can get you someone from HSI. Yeah, just side just how big of a problem is this? I think it's a big problem. I mean, I, I don't have I don't have numbers in, in front of me, Maria, but I mean, clearly, um, any pro any situation where you have uh, a policy or a procedure that's being leveraged that allows criminal activity to flourish, um, with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars being utilized in that process, um, you know, it's just as I talk about Congress shutting down loopholes with regard to family detention, so that we can stop that problem. If we can solve uh, or or at least um, address a large part of this problem by changing a, a, a regulatory process or um, rules that DOS employs, it only makes good sense to. Sir. Hi, Ben Fox from AP. Uh, on the, the birth tourism, it, it's a pretty big loophole. 
you know, this is just stopping it at sort of the visa process, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a lengthy visa period. So sort of what else can ICE or CBP and what else is being contemplated to address it sort of going forward? I mean, what other measures can you take? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna talk about anything prospectively, what we might be doing. It's clear, it's out there publicly what is being done. Um, again, CBP and ICE work very closely with regard to sharing information, sharing intelligence. We have our Border Enforcement Security Task Forces in which we have CBP and ICE working side by side um, so that we share information, we share, we have information on potential smugglers, um, organizations. It's continually shared so that if we need to have somebody go through a certain interview at, the, at a port of entry, that can be done. If we need to conduct investigative casework after the fact, um, that can be done as well, so, sir. Hi, um, my name is Neil Monroe, I'm with Breitbart News. If I may shift the subject slightly, you have new numbers coming out on the OPT program. So I was wondering, looking through the old numbers, and I see colossal levels of hiring by major companies of OPT. I mean, thousands of them a year, 4,500 being one company. This is wildly out of proportion to the OPT's presence in the American grad, uh, the, in the new college graduate market. I mean, just, so it looks like some companies are just hiring OPTs wildly in excess of their proportion in the population. Are you doing any, any investigations to see if this is national discrimination against Americans? So we have a report that's gonna be forthcoming, um, so I don't wanna get ahead of our skis on that, and, and, and I think we'll probably do some media with that and get some real in-depth um, discussion as to what those numbers are and what they, they mean. Um, but with regard to investigations we do under the CVIS program, which we oversee, um, and, and, and with these things, we have multiple investigations into employers um, that are either fraudulent employers, meaning they don't really have a company, um, and they're just utilizing that as a, as a document mill, basically, for lack of a better term, um, so for people that could stay here in the country illegally and work. Um, it's similar, frankly, to what we saw in, in Michigan with that University of Farmington with the fake college, where, where people that were here illegally had no intent to actually study, but just wanted to stay and work illegally, um, took advantage of, or tried to take advantage of um, that process, right? So same idea here. Any place time where we see fraud, where someone's trying to take advantage of a legitimate program um, illegitimately, whether it's on, par on the part of an employer or a fake employer, or whether it's on part of the, uh, the alien or the, the fake student, I'll put that in quotes, um, trying to take advantage of, of, of these programs, uh, we're gonna vigorously pursue. We have a, a, a huge footprint um, within Homeland Security Investigations that focuses on these types of investigations, and we do um, hundreds of investigations a year and make thousands of arrests for, for these types of violations. Okay, I see very, forgive me, but I see very few arrests and uh, for this white collar smuggling, if you like. You guys are going, and it appears highly successful in reducing, forgive me, the blue collar migration across the border. But I see very little movement in this. For the fine dream case was, as far as I can see, an FBI thing, and it happened three weeks after I wrote about it. And there's a bunch of other these fake, extravagantly, obviously fake companies on the list. You just read the name, see if you can find the company, it's not there, and they've been hiring thousands of these co foreign college graduates. So are you putting more effort into dealing with this white collar immigration crime compared to a couple of years ago? We certainly are. We put, it, we put out a new regulation, obviously, under, under CVIS. Um, one of the big issues with, with anything is we have over 400 federal laws that we prosecute is resources, right? If this is something that, it's something that we certainly take seriously, um, but Congress also has the ability to prioritize what gets done by providing us resources to do and address certain uh, criminal activity. Um, they've done it in the, in the drug space, they've done it in, in, other, in other realms. Um, we can be, it could be done here, but these investigations, again, while you may be able, it looks like somebody's a fraudulent company on, on its face, right? In order to actually get to the point where you can, we don't wanna just shut these things down or have somebody flee, right? A lot of these guys are foreign nationals who are gonna flee back to their home countries. We actually wanna get an investigation to the point where we can prosecute that case, present it to the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecute that case, seize the assets from the individual that they gained as a result of this, uh, uh, this fraudulent scheme, as well as getting the individuals that, that benefited from it. So it doesn't do us any good to publicize these 50 companies that we're, we're prosecuting so they can shut down, move back to China, and live off their profits or come back into the country a year or two from now and, and start a new one, right? We actually want to stop the problem, and that's putting people in jail and shutting down that pipeline. And so. what, uh, uh, Ted. Thank you, uh, Ted Hessen with Reuters, and, and thank you for holding the briefing. 
I would like to ask you about the DACA program. There was a report in CNN last month about ICE uh, reopening cases against DACA enrollees, and specifically people with either no criminal record or, or minor crimes. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that and, and what the plan is in the event that the Supreme Court um, allows President Trump's uh, termination of the program. Right, so as you're well aware, DACA provides no lawful status to anybody, right? It is not a status, it's, it's, it's just a deferral of somebody's removal process or, or removal proceedings. Um, what that was, if I remember correctly, was there were a bunch of cases that were previously administratively closed that were simply reopened and relodged with the immigration court. Those individuals may have DACA, but that doesn't prevent us from going through the removal process such that the individual at the end of that process, if they get ordered removed, and DACA is, up, is done away with by the Supreme Court, we could actually effectuate those removal orders. But it also enables these individuals, if they have a, an asylum claim or, or, or want to lodge some sort of relief, a, a, a claim for relief from removal, um, withholding or whatever the case may be, that's the avenue which they would avail themselves of. So it's just a matter of putting these cases, these cases never should have been administratively closed. Um, they should have been able to go, th go through the immigration court process um, for decisions outside of this agency and outside of this administration, they were closed. Um, we're simply reopening those cases, putting them back on the dockets so they can work their way through the, through the immigration court system. Can you give yes. us a sense of the scale? I, I, don't, I don't know the number, Ted. We can, we can, we can run it down. I, I don't have it off the top of my head. I mean, individuals that have DACA have had their cases um, continuing ongoing, right? So cases that were not closed were, were still ongoing. So ultimately, if the Supreme Court rules that these people don't have a lawful right to be here, it's incumbent, incumbent upon us either execute the removal orders that were already issued by a judge or put the individuals through the immigration court process so that we can get a decision from the judge with regard to this individual status. Again, DACA provides no lawful status here in this country. Everybody is well aware of the fact that um, it, it doesn't do that, so, ma'am. Um, Anna Giratelli with Washington Examiner. You said the market for families being smuggled to the U.S. has been, quote, killed. Um, so how are you seeing TCOs evolve now? Who are they moving? Are you seeing more stash house and tractor trailer type things in the U.S.? Um, and then Acting Secretary Wolf had said late last year that DHS was really going to start going after TCOs. Um, is HSI involved, and what are they doing? Okay. If I if I use the word killed, then, I, then that's probably the, the, the wrong term to use. I think we've, we've been able to curtail some of these, these family unit uh, smuggling organizations that are involved in that. Obviously, the problem has not been completely abated. We continually be aggressive, uh, address it. Um, but I think the market and the avenue for these individuals to be released into this country have been curtailed significantly such that the benefit of doing so is no longer available. If you, so, for example, if you had a family, someone that was paying $1,000 to rent a child in, in, in Mexico City, come to the border and then be released in Brownsville um, and then disappear into the, into the country that now has to wait in Mexico as they go through their asylum process or perhaps face, um, you know, being returned to, to Guatemala under the ACA or being subject to expedited removal, they aren't coming into the country. So there's no benefit, right? There's no reason for these smugglers to use those kids as a commodity anymore because it gives the uh, the alien will, which is trying to come here illegally, no added benefit. To your question with regard to TCOs, certainly we're hand in glove with um, law enforcement agencies um, throughout the world. We have over 70 offices overseas that work directly with them. We've put a significant investment, obviously, into the Northern Triangle and, and into Mexico. Um, we have vetted units, so we actually have law enforcement officers that work for various law enforcement agencies within these countries um, that are vetted, um, cleared to work with Homeland Security investigations and actually work um, under our purview and under our direction, we are able to provide training, support, um, intelligence, and we work uh, very closely. A lot of the prosecutions of these smuggling organizations, right, you have these, these ringleaders of these organizations never come to this country. We may not be able to get a prosecution for them in this country uh, or get enough evidence where we can get an extradition warrant to get them to this country to prosecute them, but they can be prosecuted in their home countries for those crimes, and that's what we do. Sir.
Thanks for holding the briefing. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping you might be able to speak to reports we've seen that there's a new list of countries the administration plans to I implement can't. travelers. For, no. Has ICE made any preparations for enforcing I, I, those I, I restrictions can't speak if they're violated? That might be contemplated. You know that. I, I mean, is so no ICE taking any preparations to enforce any kind of travel restrictions that might be coming down? So again, can't speak to anything that might be coming. Um, ICE doesn't work at the ports of entry. We don't control entry and exit into this country. So, um, you For know. people who are already here, any kind of? I'm not sure I could be any more clear. I can't speak to anything that might be coming down. On the, if I could ask a question about the fraudulent family stats sure. you described. Um, what's the, you said, have, have those uh, increased? Uh, can you give us a sense of, of what's been happening over the past year with the latest numbers you yeah, have? Yeah, so when we, start, we first run, started running the pilot, um, both with the fa fraudulent families and when we incorporated um, Operation Double Helix, which is when we were doing the DNA testing as well, we were seeing a fraud rate close to 20%. Um, what we're seeing now, the fraud rate is, is, is down around 10% and, and maybe go down even, even the single digits. So we've seen a steady trajectory of the fraud rate decreasing, which is why I'm confident in saying that our efforts in this space um, are being effective with regard to shutting down some of these criminal, this criminal activity, whether it's re recycling of the children, uh, whether it's just plain old smuggling organizations facilitating the entry of these family units here to this country. Um, I think all of those work in combination um, to reduce that pull factor and prevent some of those that might otherwise come um, from coming. just want to follow up real quick on birth tourism because it is something that HSI has investigated and worked on. Um, are you going to provide additional guidance to the field uh, given the new regulation by State Department? Well, well certainly. Anytime a new regulation comes out that impacts our operations, we obviously work closely with um, the agencies that are putting out these regulations when we, when we all have a piece of that pie. Um, but yes, anything that changes, uh, just as if there's a court decision that comes down or a new law is passed, we continually provide guidance to our officers and agents in the field with regard to how to actually implement either a regulation, a policy, a statute, whatever the case may be. Do you also work with airlines on this? We do some work with airlines. Uh, I mean, certainly there's information, I, I should mention it in human trafficking context, right, where you have um, people at the stewardesses and, or, or, you know, flight attendants that see evidence of individuals being trafficked. Um, that share that information with us. Um, so yeah, we work with uh, lots of private industry, um, especially in, in this area, but in, in, in all areas, certainly. And one last question, is Operation Noble Guardian now across the southern border? So Noble state? Guardian, actually most of it is actually ha happening in the interior of the country. So right, these are, these are family units that were, fake family units that were, got in and then dispersed into the, in, in the interior of the country. And now we're trying to locate them um, and arrest and prosecute both the criminal organizations that are involved in this as well as the adult that posed with this unrelated child so that they could be released into the interior. Um, so yeah, that's happening around the country and you know, I see the reports every day we're, we're getting calls on, on Noble Guardian leads where we're running out and either making arrests or conducting interviews in furtherance of these investigations. So anytime we've got, we received information that a family was fake and they had already been released, we certainly would conduct an investigation immediately upon receiving that information. Um, with some investigative techniques that I'm not in, in going to reveal in a setting such as this, um, we've been able to identify further families that might have, um, or, or there's indicia of fraud at the time of entry, that we're able to leverage that, conduct investigations, and if we find out that in fact there was fraud, then we start looking at taking in, in Uh, I don't have that number in front of me. It's not, I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to throw one out there. Um, we can. We can pull it up and see how many people. Do. But a lot of what we see, the people that are released, again, a lot of the people that we have in custody, Congress has already spoken to with regard to them posing a flight or a public safety risk, which are those reasons that we hold individuals in custody because they flight, public safety risk. Seventy-two percent of the people that we have in custody are subject to mandatory detention by Congress. So we don't have a lot of discretion with regard to a lot of the people we have in custody. Now, when we do arrest somebody that is, that does not fall under the mandatory detention categories, we do a case-by-case -case analysis to determine whether or not this individual poses a public safety or a flight risk. But most of those individuals that are not subject to mandatory detention have the ability to go in front of an immigration judge and ask for a bond, or if a bond was placed, to ask for a reduction in bond or a release on. So 
Um, a lot of the releases actually occur once the individual goes in front of the immigration judge and the judge issues a bond for them um, and they get released that way. So. So the last number I saw, and it's about a week or so old, um, was I believe 96 individuals had been returned to um, Guatemala under the ACA. Um, I think one of those individuals actually stayed and, and decided to pursue um, their, an asylum claim in, in that country. Um, what we have found is that, again, most of the people that come here to try to claim asylum don't meet the legal threshold for asylum in this country. The actual approval rate hovers around 10% in Northern Triangle, it's below that. So most of the people that are coming here to claim asylum don't actually qualify for asylum. So when they find out that they're not going to be released into this country and they have to wait either in Mexico or in this case they could be returned to Guatemala and pursue their asylum claim there, most of them drop their claims and say, you know what, never mind, just send me back to my home country. Um, so again, whether their claim is, is such that it doesn't reach the legal threshold or whether it's just a, it's, it's an invalid false claim on its face. Um, most individuals would confront them with the, the option of going to another country um, or going back to their home country, take their home country, which to me calls into question the validity of that asylum claim to begin with. I, I don't have any updates on the other ones, Ted, that's being run out of DHS on, on the other country. Yes, I don't, I, at this point we haven't returned any Mexicans to, as, unless I'm wrong, we haven't returned any Mexicans to Guatemala. I, I'll, I called on her first, so. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, not you, Maria, I'll give you your next Maria. Sorry, okay. Um, oh, sorry, are you doing anything new? Is HSI doing anything new in, re, in reference to the Super Bowl, um, human trafficking and uh, even, th just in reference to the Super Bowl, have efforts changed in any way this year? I don't think, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say efforts have changed. I think every year as we go through events such as this, we get better. Um, we know how, Ben, we've been doing this for a long time. I was involved when I was a deputy sack in the Super Bowl in Detroit, Super, uh, XL, in whatever that was, 2006, 2007. Um, and sure, we've progressed, we've gotten better with intelligence sharing, we've gotten better with regard to um, getting information from these industries that might come in contact with these uh, trafficking victims. Again, most of the time we're getting tips, we're getting leads to identify these, these organizations. And so um, we work very closely with the local law enforcement agencies there, the other feds that are obviously on scene. Um, so we continue to look to refine and, and, and improve our processes, but we've gotten pretty good at identifying these organizations when we find, and taking them down when, when we find them. But we'll continue to look for new ways to, to get better. We're never gonna stop trying to improve and, and, and help the people that are being victimized. Um, I, thank you. So um, I wanted to ask about ICE arrests in the first quarter. Um, w what are you seeing? Are the numbers rising in the interior now that um, border arrests are declining? Well, you know, that's one of the things that um, sometimes gets lost in the, in the shuffle with regard to um, the numbers that we saw at, at look, I I'd still say we're in a crisis, but the crisis that we, saw, we were at in, in spring of last year was certainly um, greater than the one we were experiencing now, um, but we're still getting numbers that lead to 400 or so thousand individuals, if not more, uh, coming to this country illegally, which is too many um, to begin with. Um, but we have to remember that all those cases, all those individuals, all those hundreds of thousands of people, especially family units that were, or in UAC that were released, those cases, those people here in the country now, we have to follow those cases through the, the entirety of the immigration court process um, so there's docket work that has to be done by ERO with regard to managing these cases, dealing with uh, individuals on alternative detention, dealing with check-ins, um, a, a huge workload for OPLA, our Office of Principal Legal Advisor, so our attorneys. So as you know, uh, EOIR has been plussed up by Congress for judges at significant levels over the past three or four years to help deal with the backlog, and that's great. But if they don't give commensurate increases to us, to OPLA for our attorneys, 
so they can actually litigate these cases and prosecute them in front of an immigration court, all you've done is increase the bottleneck. You've seen our non-detained docket grow by hundreds of thousands over the past couple of years as a direct result of the massive numbers of people coming to this country illegally, our, in our inability to hold them and handle those cases on the detained docket, and then the lack of resources to actually get these cases through the immigration court. Um, so, so did the numbers go down again in this quarter? I don't, have, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I mean, I will tell you that we're out there every day vigorously doing it. Obviously, there's things that are out there that are making it harder. One, the workload I just talked about for all those hundreds of thousands, and actually millions of cases that are out there on our dockets right now. Um, the jurisdictions that continue to fail to cooperate with us and new jurisdictions that, that turn away from us. So where we used to be able to arrest somebody in a jail with one officer or a contract um, transportation company picking that individual up and bringing them to our office for processing now requires a team of five or six officers to go out and try to locate this individual. Maybe they find them, maybe they don't, but we've certainly expended dozens if not hundreds of hours trying to find one person that we could have gotten in 30 minutes. Um, so it certainly creates inefficiencies in the system, puts our officers at risk, obviously puts the general public at risk, and it puts the individual we're trying to arrest at risk as well. It's safer for everybody to do it in the confines of a detention center. So yeah, as long as roadblocks continue to be thrown up, it's going to, it's going to cut into our inefficiencies. That doesn't mean we're going to stop what we're doing, and that's why, we, as you see what we're doing, the subpoenas, we're being aggressive against these jurisdictions so that we can actually do our jobs more effectively. Um, but then you continue to have these states um, and, and localities that pass these wrong-headed laws um, like the green light law in, in New York, or they're cutting us out of getting DMV data, that's incredibly dangerous. Um, think about what that means. I mean, we had a, an officer, a couple special agents responding to um, the shooting at, at the Jewish market in, in Jersey City last month. And the agents there on the ground seeing vehicles that are involved or could be involved in the shooting couldn't run the tag to find out who that vehicle belonged to and was that individual involved in that situation. That's crazy. You are putting people at risk at things like that. You talk about human trafficking. If we're setting up on a house where we believe is being utilized for prostitution by human trafficking rings, and we're seeing cars coming in and out all day long, and we can't pull those tags and find out who's actually driving those vehicles and conduct investigations to see who's facilitating this, this, this trafficking and taking advantage of these people, it cuts out our ability to actually save and rescue people and prosecute these organizations. So anything that curtails information sharing Information is the lifeblood of law enforcement, right? That was the whole thing after 9-11, why DHS was stood up, because there was all these disparate pieces of information being held by all these different agencies, and they weren't meshed together. That's what we've largely done in this department, is start doing that, and across the interagency, we've gotten a lot better at sharing information and making sure there aren't those stovepipes. But when you have states that are cutting out the federal government from doing their job and getting information that's critical to the safety of this country and the citizens that these people are supposed to be representing, it's ridiculous. So, I mean, if the, we really appreciate the briefing. Um, if it's possible to start getting data on a monthly basis, like CBP issues, I think, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate that. Like, if you could find out, like, just steady numbers well of we've arrests. Been do we've been like doing that. quarterly calls, Maria, so I don't know if No, just not, like, every, like, CBP just issues the information on a monthly basis. If we could get that, that would be great. Just a request. Okay. Thanks. Sir, did you have something? All right. Are there any uh, benefits that they will lose from not cooperating with the federal government? I don't know if there's anything that um, you know, I, could, I could speak to on that. I mean, I think the, the first thing that we would try to do, and which we're trying to do, is get compliance with the lawfully issued subpoena and, and get the court to, if they're not going to co comply with that subpoena, get the court to um, forcibly enforce that subpoena. But they could, the individuals that, that fail to comply can be held in contempt. They can, they can show up to court with a toothbrush because they may not be coming home that night because they could, go to, they could be jailed for failure to comply with a, with a lawful order from a judge. So um, that's the route we're going. Um, it's unfortunate. And hopefully maybe when some of these other jurisdictions that, that don't want to cooperate um, see that you know, we're taking this seriously, maybe they'll come around and, and, see, and, and try to help us help their own communities. On the sanctuary city uh, concerns, uh, w one of the big concerns from local law enforcement and uh, local communities generally is that these 287G agreements will flag, you know, unresolved charges, minor charges, and they, then the police departments are then required to use their res their own resources to get those people into immigration custody. Um, could you explain how ICE, uh, 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 um, 
uses their uses their discretion in those cases to make sure that the most serious criminals flagged in local law enforcement agencies are are targeted here. All right, so 287G is a voluntary program. There is no law enforcement agency that's conscripted in the service of ICE to perform immigration enforcement functions. So an, uh, an agency that wants to join us under the 287G program has made their evaluation internally under their, their rules and guidelines and their resource uh, constraints as to that this is worthwhile for them. Um, so nobody is forced into working with us. So the jurisdictions that cooperate or that work under 287G are doing so cooperatively. Um, what 287G does is identify every single individual it, that comes into that jail that is potentially subject to removal. It gives the authority to those officers that are, have gone through training, meet the statutory requirement for an immigration officer to perform immigration enforcement functions uh, on our behalf. Um, it generally doesn't take a, a, a large amount of time to process that individual and have them um, turned over to us for, for further removal proceedings. In some cases, we have um, intergovernmental service agreements where we actually utilize those detention facilities where the individuals are being held to keep those individuals. So it's not even uh, much more thing. I would say that the work that's being done on the front end is a lot less than having to re arrest this guy three, four, five more times and he keeps going back out and committing crimes. That's why these agencies have joined the program because they were tired of seeing these individuals that are here in this country illegally getting involved in further criminal activity and not being able to do something about them or having them bond out before ICE can respond or being prohibited from honoring a detainer from uh, their jurisdiction. So that's why they're trying to cooperate with us because they know it's a public safety risk. It's good police work to get criminals off the street, whether you get them off for the criminal violation or whether we're able to utilize um, you know, uh, an immigration charge with which to do that. So. And could you clarify that point about recidivism? Is are you, are, you're not saying that it's uh, the rates are higher in uh, for immigrant criminal offenders than for any criminal offenders? Are you? No, what I'm saying is what we have seen of these individuals that we arrest, most of them are career criminals. Very few are first-time offenders. Um, as I mentioned, an average of four arrests per or, or charges per individual we arrested last year. Um, and those again, those are the only crimes that they were arrested by those local jurisdictions for. Um, so. You know, we've seen in some cohorts of individuals that we've been tracking, uh, recidivism rates almost as high as 50%. Um, that's very troubling. It has nothing to do with whether they're, they're immigrant or not. These are the individuals that we're talking about. No one said, we're not talking about the studies that say this and that of various, there's US citizen crime, immigrant crime. But, the cri but these individuals that are here illegally committing crimes, right? They shouldn't be here in this country first in the first place. They're here illegally. The crime rate should be zero because there shouldn't be the people here illegally to begin with. They're here illegally, then they're committing additional crimes on top. So people that try to compare those two things are comparing apples and oranges. I just wondered if you could go back to that. You mentioned the Jewish deli crime, and can you just expand on that on what, what you weren't able to get and how that affected anything? Well, I'm not gonna get into the, the whole thing, but as there's anything else, when you run, just as if, if you were to go out here and blow through a red light on your way home and DC police pulled you over and they run your tag, they're gonna get, you know, who's probably driving this car. They're gonna get your registration. They're gonna find out where it's, where it's registered. Um, they're gonna come get your driver's license. They're gonna run you through NCIC to see if you have any wants or warrants. They're gonna do all sorts of things. So all that information that we don't have access to um, because we can't get that initial tag. But inf again, information is the lifeblood. Not knowing who is operating a vehicle or who that person might be um, and what they might be up to. Are they a friendly? Are they, are they there to, to, to do something uh, harmful? We don't know, um, but I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a reason why when you go out down any street in this city and you see cop cars go by, they've got cameras on their side and reading every single driver's, or excuse me, license plate when they go down the street. Because they're trying to see who's there, what they're up to, are there warrants, is this car stolen, all these various things that law enforcement agencies do to enforce the law. So, think we're good, Brian, or what? All right, all right, thanks everybody, appreciate it. Um, we can do a few. Yeah.